Hello, and welcome to 472 Maine, a show about issues and people uh, here in Acton. I'm Steve Ledoux, I'm the town manager, and uh, our guest today is Margaret Smith. Margaret is the editor of The Beacon, and we're kind of doing a role reversal today where I get to ask Margaret questions uh, as opposed to the hundreds of questions she's asked me over the last five years as, as town manager. So welcome to the show, Margaret. Glad to have you. Thank you, Steve. I'm glad to be here. Thank and uh, you know, one of the things I like to, like to do, particularly if, if there's young people uh, watching, uh, is to find out how people chose their profession and what got them involved in, 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 in your case, in journalism. So can you tell us a little about how you uh, chose this for a profession. Sure. Well, I think writing and journalism uh, have something that I, I've always been interested in going way back. I think certainly growing up in the Boston area where we have been blessed with great local media in television and, and newspapers that had a big influence on me. I was on my high school paper, an editor of my college paper, and um, actually started working as a journalist, as a freelance writer while I was still in college. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd say that um, I just sort of knew that this was my destiny yeah. oh, early cool. on. Oh, good. Um, uh, you know, my, my sense is, and you know, maybe, maybe it's just the way the media, the, the media has changed a lot, at least in, in, in my lifetime. And when I was in college, I happened to be during the time of Watergate. So, you know, we, we had the whole, the whole uh, uh, issue, you know, with, with, with Nixon and with the Washington Post and that whole, uh, you know, I, I would guess kind of the high point of investigative journalism, but you know, it seems like we've somewhat gotten away from that. Uh, do you find young people are intrigued by uh, journalism in the media? As, I, mean, I know they are in the media, but in terms of journalism, are they intrigued, or do you s see that kind of dropping off as, as an interest? Well, I believe that they still are, and in fact, I know that to be true. Um, one of the reasons that I know this is because, um, first of all, when we have our summer internships, they're basically always full. We always have young people um, in college looking to work with the Beacon and to the newspapers that are related to us um, in the company. And so um, you're absolutely right. Technology and the different media that we now have has certainly grown and changed and evolved. But I think people's basic desire to find out information, to know what's going on in their communities, and uh, for young people for whom that's really a vocation, I think that remains unchanged. I mm -hmm. think it's a matter of how they want to pursue mm -hmm. uh, that media. And certainly, I've spoken in different journalism classes, and friends of mine who are journalism professors um, are always telling me that their classes are full. And here in Acton, where of course we do a lot of coverage in the schools, um, I spent a lot of time talking to students um, at the Acton Boxborough um, Regional High School, for example, and um, we're always so warmly welcomed by them, and um, they're always so appreciative of an effort to interact with the paper, either sending in notices about their achievements or activities that they're doing. Um, so I would say that journalism as ever has a future, and um, there will always be people coming forward who are dedicated to it. Yeah. And you never know, you know, who's going who's gonna to make it. I, I, uh, uh, back in the 80s, I, I was town manager in Williamstown, Mass, uh, up until like 96, and uh, uh, a very young reporter for uh, the, the North Adams transcript was Danny Pearl. So, like, I, I knew Danny Pearl and was interviewed by Danny Pearl long before you know, unfortunately, what what happened to him? But you know, clearly, he he was a, he was a rising star in journalism. An unfortunate uh, execution happened to him. Um, what are the most challenging aspects of of uh, being an editor and, and being in the uh, newspaper business? I would say probably it's very simply the the thing that also makes it the most joyful, which is it's the constant flow of information and the constant flow of change. Um, I will never have a day. Well, I, I will say that I am bored or disinterested mm -hmm. in my job because um, any day can present a challenge in terms of, of breaking news, mm -hmm. whether that's a public safety situation or um, in this case, as we're going into our taping, of course, we have a special town meeting right. coming up um, that is looking at the school regionalization plan between Acton and Boxborough, but also several other issues mm -hmm. um, that are unique to Acton. So the challenge is keeping up with that information, um, dealing with it in a timely way, mm -hmm. making sure it's accurate, of course, before it goes out mm -hmm. to the public, and when it needs to be built on and needs to be updated. But again, that's also, that's also the part I would say that energizes you, yeah. you know, every day as well. Well, well it's interesting, because it's, it's a lot like my job. I mean, I never know 
from day to day or moment to moment sometimes what I'm going to get into and I, I can have all the best plans of what I want to accomplish in any given day and it, it totally get refocused on, on something else. So, I mean, to me, that, that also it's makes my job enjoyable too because it's, it's the variety and, 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 and the challenges you just don't even anticipate sometimes. Well, as you say, it's good to have a plan, right. and then there's the other plan right. that you might have to improvise a little bit exactly. when the circumstances change. Exactly. Uh, you did talk about the, uh, the, uh, the upcoming special town meeting, which may be after our show here, but uh, uh, has already happened. But uh, uh, what do you see as, as you know, as from you, you put your observer hat on, um, what, uh, what do you see as some of the big issues and challenges Acton is facing? Well, I would say that um, the things that are that are the biggest challenges right now in Acton, um, and as you mentioned, um, the, the town meeting is almost imminent, so um, folks may be watching this after the, the results, but I, I would argue that regardless of which way the results of that go, um, the issues that brought the regionalization pact to, to the forefront are, you know, will remain. And um, certainly there's been a lot of concern about what are the trends in enrollment mm -hmm. in the schools. Um, Acton for many years, of course, and I would argue still remains so, was a great attraction for young families because of the school system. Mm -hmm. um, some of those children are now growing up and moving on. And so the question remains, what are the demographics going to be? But as we all know, that could change too. Mm -hmm. There could always be trends that change, that could uh, make it ebb and flow. So I think that's certainly something that, um, and certainly you and your seat as the town manager would see that, that um, the folks involved in trying to have a thoughtful plan for the town's future mm -hmm. are looking at, um, along with the challenges of the economy, which uh, all of our communities have been dealing with. Um, in some ways, Acton has perhaps been better positioned to deal with some of those challenges. Um, although that said, um, as I talked to the staff at the food pantry and the community supper, they have told me that there's, they have seen recently an increase in people who are in need. Mm -hmm. There are also agencies in town that try to help those people. Um, and as the economy hopefully improves, perhaps that will change. But that's certainly, I would argue, a challenge oh, yeah, that, the, that the town has faced. Um, I would say a, a great demographic change that has happened and continues to unfold is the diversity mm -hmm. in Acton. And again, the school system, as school systems often are, are a good place to look at that almost in a microcosm. And uh, part of the outcome of that is are some of the cultural institutions that have now um, evolved, um, perhaps most notably the Acton Chinese Language School. And I say that because they just celebrated their 10th anniversary. Right, right. Um, and they also have um, an Acton Chinese New Year, which is not only for the Chinese community, but anyone who wants to participate. Mm -hmm. It's become part of the, main, the mainstream of the identity of Acton. And, um, and another uh, interesting event that's coming up and is going to be enjoying its second year is the Essence of India mm -hmm. Festival, mm -hmm. um, started by a group of citizens, including um, the artist Sunanda Sahay. Mm -hmm. And I would say uh, that those are some of the, both the greatest challenges and perhaps the greatest opportunities yeah. facing oh, the town. Yeah. We also had, I think, like at least two years in a row now, I think uh, the Sri Lankan Festival over, yes. at the, over at NARA as well. And you're right, I mean, the diversity is uh, you know, something that certainly example, has, yes. has, has struck me in my five years here I as well. I mean, mm -hmm. I think, and I, I think I'm right about this, the Conant School is, is pretty close to 50% Asian uh, right yeah, now. Yeah, I believe so, that's true, yeah. Yeah, yeah so that, you know, diversity is, is becoming a big issue. So uh, I, I was going to ask, in, in your time as editor, mm -hmm. uh, how has Acton changed? I mean, obviously, diversity is, 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 is one piece I think that's changed quite a bit, but any, any other changes that... Uh, yeah, I, I would say I would say one thing that is continually growing and again evolving mm -hmm. um, as a focus is sustainability, mm -hmm. and of course that's not unique to Acton as such uh, because our whole nation and indeed our, our whole world is looking at issues of how we conserve our resources. Um, but I would say in Acton again in, in the schools, there's uh, been several programs to reduce energy consumption and as well in a practical um, in the moment way, but also educate. Mm -hmm. students mm -hmm. about the need for doing this. Um, certainly there's a great deal of concern about preserving open space and um, there is uh, a significant movement within Acton to look at things like how do we make sure that there's enough open space um, right. that is preserved uh, both in terms of preserving habitat and conservation but also perhaps for land for future mm -hmm. uses mm -hmm. in, in the town if the need should arise 
and um, certainly looking at the future of the water quality in the town, um, sort of basic needs of you know air and, and water. Yeah. So I would say sustainability um, on all fronts is something that um, folks in Acton are looking at um, and are trying to find answers to. Yeah, absolutely. And consensus I mean, on. we just started our, our solar project on on the landfill this past uh, yes. about a week or so ago. If you drive by Route Two, you can kind of see it starting. And you know, open space. Obviously, we have a, a land purchase at the special town meeting for roughly 20 acres to, to preserve so you know clearly I mean that is a very important issue to a lot of folks in town uh, what's, your, what's your circulation just out of curiosity sure. with the big Our, the circulation right now is about 4,000 mm -hmm. and um, readership which is cal in, in industry terms is calculated a little bit differently readership mm -hmm. is probably closer to 12,000 no, that's um, because of the, the website online it's it's because of that and also because of um, traditionally when one person say buys a copy of the newspaper subscribe to it there's probably at least three or four people mm -hmm. friends or people in the household that mm -hmm. are reading it mm -hmm. so the readership mm -hmm. that's why I say the the readership times mm -hmm. three would probably be closer to 12,000 yeah. or perhaps oh, more okay yeah oh, that's I never thought about it that way that, that that's uh, interesting um, you know, it's been a lot of talk that uh, the print media is is, is kind of kind of dying. There's, you know, there's a lot of instantaneous news out there that you know, like I, I, I use the example of when the uh, the whole uh, uh, Boston bomber issue was happening in Watertown that day. Uh, my kids, who were both in college, I mean, they weren't watching Channel Five. <laughs> they weren't watching. They were on Reddit, and people were posting, you know. Uh, uh, Things from the police blog or police uh, radios and things like that, and and they seemingly knew more that was happening quicker than than the folks that were broadcasting on TV. So, how does how does this whole way we're we're getting our news change your approach? And and what what are some of the different ways uh, the Beacon is is using media to kind of keep up with this really rapidly changing uh, technology that we're all dealing with? Well, as you say, first of all, there's no question um, that technology has changed just so much not only in the past 20 years but but even year to year and, and perhaps even even less than that and the beacon has um, a very active um, website if I may it's wickedlocalactin.com mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. its companion wickedlocalboxbro.com for mm -hmm. the town of Boxborough which we also cover mm -hmm. that's an opportunity for us to as you say to post breaking news in the moment and also um, the, the Boston Marathon bomber that you mentioned mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a really excellent example of a situation that was changing almost minute by minute but closer to home say for example um, the recent annual town meetings mm -hmm. Um, I, I was online um, at the town meetings and uh, posting to our website when votes were coming in as well as to Facebook and mm -hmm. Twitter mm -hmm. so that we could provide an ongoing update and immediate update mm -hmm. of what was happening on the floor of mm -hmm. the town halls. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about media now, I think we really talk about a kind of an integrated um, uh, landscape, if you will, of the so-called print media, as we say in, um, in the industry, which is basically the, the newspaper, mm -hmm. and um, augmented by the website and Facebook and Twitter. And I think it, it becomes the responsibility to make those things work together well, mm -hmm. so they are serving people well mm -hmm. by providing um, information in, uh, in a proper and accurate an immediate way. Um, you mentioned about Reddit. I hope you'll indulge me. It mm -hmm. uh, actually reminded me of uh, something quite humorous that happened at mm -hmm. the Memorial Day observances in Acton that I was covering um, mm -hmm. this uh, this past Monday, and uh, and a little poignant too. There was a, a dad who came up to his daughter, who was a senior at the mm -hmm. high school, and she was in the Acton uh, Boxborough Colonials marching band. Mm -hmm. They were taking a little break. He was taking some pictures of her, He's, and he says, um, "Oh, this is my last chance to embarrass you before you go <laughs> off to college." And her little sister came running up, who was about 10 years old, and they were um, sort of mugging for a picture together. And I said, well, how do you guys plan to stay in touch, you know, when you go on to college? And her little sister said, oh, well, we can FaceTime each other. <laughs> and both the dad and the, and the daughter, who's a, the older daughter who's a senior in high school, both exchanged these sort of puzzled looks <laughs> um, as if to say, what is FaceTime? <laughs> um, so again, things are changing, you know, yeah. by leaps and bounds. Oh, yeah. and, um, and that, again, poses challenges, but I would argue also great opportunities yeah. to keep people connected with their communities. Yeah. Yeah. and to keep them informed and also give them a place to have a dialogue yeah. about the issues that are important to them. I mean, do you think there will come a time when the print media will basically be non-existent? I mean, I think about, you know, people in my parents' generation. I mean, 
obviously they lived every day to read their morning paper and, and, and things like that, but now everything is so much online. Do you think at, at some point it's, it's kind of like e-books and, and, and everything? I mean, are we going to get away from print altogether at some point? Well, I would say, firstly, the, the press has 500 years of institutional knowledge and wisdom and learning behind it. Mm -hmm. And um, that I think that used properly and wisely can only carry it forward. Um, I certainly see, as we've talked about, that the other forms of media are, I would say, perhaps here to stay, and yet they are also ever-changing. I think that print still has the appeal of preserving things in a kind of perpetuity that I would argue that the online forms uh, perhaps still have to, perhaps only time will show how well they mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. And whereas print has a proven mm -hmm. um, ability to do that. I will also say um, anecdotally that I still have uh, people from the high school and even younger coming up to me. Um, they're very happy to have their pictures in the paper. It's important for them to mm -hmm. see their stories and experiences um, carried out in the press. And I think as long as, speaking as a local newspaper editor, as long as, as we're faithful and I, as I, as the editor of the Beacon, am faithful to my mission to cover the community, then um, as long as we do that role and do it well, uh, people will always need us and see need for us, and that's a great strength um, and also a great responsibility. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, I, I still like to I still like to read the the old-fashioned Sunday newspaper. I mean, there's something about it I find particularly comforting, and you know, it just seems like you know, in this day and age, we deal with so many less like sound bites and, and quick news. It's it, it's really hard sometimes to really get to the heart of the issue and, and find out the, you know, the whole story behind it and, and things like that. So. And, uh, and, and what you say is, is true. Uh, conveying news is almost kind of a two-fold job. There's the news that's happening in the moment mm -hmm. that, that we were talking about, and then being able to step back and reflect and try to analyze it. Uh, because the fact is that these issues, um, not only on the national level, but even here on a community level, such as here in Acton, are very complicated. Mm -hmm. And they deserve the airing to explore them in the complicated way that they mm -hmm. deserve. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, a good newspaper has a role to play in that way and a responsibility. And that's one of the things that a newspaper can do and, um, and again, draws its strength from the people in the town who contribute to it mm -hmm. and look to it mm -hmm. for the news mm -hmm. and let us know what the news is as mm -hmm. well. Because we depend on the people in the community as well to mm -hmm. let us know what's going on and what's important to them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Well. I'd uh, like to thank you, Margaret, for being on our show today. I think it's, I've learned a lot, actually, so uh, it's always a good thing. And, uh, you know, once again, uh, Margaret's the editor of The Beacon, so, uh, you know, pick up a copy or read it online and uh, keep informed with the town. So on, on behalf of 472 Maine, thank you very much, and thank our viewers, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. It's been a pleasure. Searching the town for volunteers to fill several openings on town boards and committees. If you have any interest in volunteering, Acton would love your help. A complete list of the current volunteer opportunities, as well as an application form, can be found on the town website.
Hello, and welcome to 472 Maine, uh, a show about issues and people uh, in the town of Acton. I'm Steve Ledoux. I'm the town manager, and our goal of the show is to make you uh, acquainted with some of our uh, town departments and some of the issues that we are facing uh, in the town. Uh, today, our guest is uh, Fire Chief Pat Futerer. Uh, I was going to say our new fire chief, but he's really uh, almost been here a year. A year coming up. But uh, he's new to a lot of folks because, uh, you know, you probably haven't seen him before. So hence is, hence is why he's on the show. So, Pat, um, tell us a little about uh, why you became a firefighter to start with. Well, my uh, father-in-law was a captain on the Joliet Fire Department, and uh, he had his own private company on the side. So when I was working at my um, grocery store business that I uh, worked with, um, I'd work with him part-time, and every time I'd leave working for him, going to work, I said, there's something wrong here. He had a lot of free time. I said, I wanted that, and uh, so I, I joined the fire department in 1989 and haven't realized that uh, free time ever since. Uh, I went back to school and uh, just delved into it, got into special teams. I um, went for my associates, my bachelor's, and after that I did the executive fire officer program. So it's been um, basically a, a drive from him um, that I've gotten to where I am today, and it's just uh, something that once I got into it, I fell in love with it. So it's a, it a great opportunity to do. And for the viewers, they may, they may wonder, why, why do firefighters have free time? Uh, typically, uh, a fire department uh, Firefighters work 24 uh, hours on as a shift, and they have uh, 24 hours off. They come back for 24 hours on, and usually they have four or five days off before their next shift. So it sounds like uh, they have a lot of time off, but working 24 hours straight is probably not too much fun. No, it's not. Uh, with the, the um, training that we have to do, um, which is mandated by the state in both EMS and fire, <clears throat> we're getting further into fire. Uh, we have a lot of opportunities for growth. Um, when we do our training, um, I've always told our guys here in Acton that when they get their certification or their training, we can't take it away as a department or a town. Mm -hmm. They can take that and, and grow with it, and when they retire, possibly come up with another opportunity to uh, be productive outside the fire service. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, the, the idea of, oh, they have so much time off isn't... Uh, isn't really true anymore. Um, we we work hard at what we do. We train a lot, and then we prepare for what right. incidents do come along. And you absolutely have to train because you never know what you're going to run into. That's exactly correct. Uh, so tell us a little about uh, your firefighting career. How you progressed through uh, through the ranks and things like that. Again, it was uh, in eight, 1989 that I decided to get on the department, and um, I had a lot of uh, people that I chose as mentors that. Um, showed me the way to, to get into the fire service and really get into it. Um, as we were going through our EMTB school, um, they stated, oh, and by the way, you're going to be a paramedic. And I went, okay. Um, so I grabbed onto that and ended up being the EMS coordinator for six years in the town that I li uh, lived in and went through, like I said, all the training, all the classes. Um, during the time I was at school. I also was on specialty teams to include the hazmat team, the fire investigation team, the department honor guard. So I kept busy and um, it, when you do that you kind of uh, get to the point where you don't see the family a lot. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a thing that um, after I got out of the EMS office I went back online and uh, I was able to slow down a little bit and uh, concentrate on certain things. So mm -hmm. it was nice. Okay. Uh, what attracted you to Acton? Clearly, you, you know, you, you were uh, you're from Illinois, from Joliet, which most people probably know as the home of the Blues Brothers, but <laughs> <laughs> besides that, uh, what attracted you to the, to the town? Why did you make uh, uh, the, the trip halfway across the country? When I went through all the training, it, especially at the National Fire Academy, they teach you to be a chief or take the role of a chief. And it, I felt it was something that I wanted to do and uh, my wife and I have been coming out to the East Coast, not to the Northeast, but uh, to the East Coast for probably 25 years. We love the East Coast, and after our first interview with Acton, um, I brought my wife back out the following weekend, and uh, she fell in love with it, I fell in love with it, so it was the 
good fit. Mm -hmm. We really liked the, the area and we wanted to mm -hmm. stay here. And your son's going to school in Rhode Island as well, Yes, right? he is, and that, that was a plus for mom. Yeah. Uh, not sure if he's totally enjoying it because we get to go down <laughs> there a lot, a lot more often, so we'll see how that goes for him. <laughs> So obviously you, you followed uh, uh, Bob Craig, who was, uh, I think, the chief for pretty close to 20 years, I think, if, if my, my, my memory is serving me well. Yes. Uh, what changes uh, do you uh, see for the future of the Acton Fire Department now that uh, you're in charge? Well, I, I had been um, taking a look prior to coming out and had a, kind of a, a ballpark idea of what I'd like to do with the department. And then I've come in, gotten my feet wet, as they say, and I decided to revisit the north station um, we need to get coverage for the north station we have a lot of uh, people living in the northern portion of the town and there's no ems or fire coverage there isn't there's no one up there mm -hmm. we have our station one by town hall that is actually the the coverage for it and um, i'm currently living in avalon of acton and um, it does take them because i did have to call them one day uh, it took them 11 minutes to get there. Mm -hmm. uh, from a fire chief standpoint, let alone a citizen's, it's totally unacceptable. Yeah, isn't like the uh, the national standard something like four minutes? Four to six minutes. Yeah. And um, a, a lot of people may say, well, why do you send an engine to a call? Well, we do that to shorten that time period up mm -hmm. so we can get EMTs onto the scene to, to start treatment for the patient. Mm -hmm. um, or the fire engine to get up there before the other crews get there to start t some type of tactics mm -hmm. to uh, rectify the situation. Mm -hmm. And if we can get another, de um, another station fully staffed closer to that northern portion um, to fill that gap and to complete it, that's what we need to do. So mm -hmm. I'm going to be revisiting the fourth uh, station. Also, we currently provide paramedics through a third service, which everyone knows is pro. Mm -hmm. um, we get to the scene they'll come right up behind us or uh, we may get to a scene and say you know what they really need more help than we can do as EMTs mm -hmm. so we'll call for them. Uh, I want to get to the, de the department to the level to where as soon as we're on a scene we're starting treatment. We mm -hmm. can go ahead and do everything that a hospital can do within the first 10 to 15 minutes of a, a code for mm -hmm. a full arrest that mm -hmm. they can do. Mm -hmm. As far as drug therapy, electrical intervention, um, we need that to provide that for our townspeople. Okay. Maybe, maybe you can help the viewers because, uh, you know, probably a lot of folks don't know the difference between an emergency management technician and a, and a um, the paramedic. paramedic. So maybe just briefly distinguish sure. what's the difference between the two. EMT basic is EMTB. Um, they can do CPR, bandaging, um, some minor care. Um, actually, we're upgrading our level in B of care to being able to take blood glucose readings mm -hmm. to find out what the blood sugar of the patient is. Then after that, um, we're also able to give albuterol treatments. If someone's having a respiratory problem, an asthmatic, they can go ahead and give them the breathing treatment that before we had to wait for pro to show up. So we're actually getting a little more progressive. The guys are really getting in there and, and taking care of business and the patients are the ones that are getting better faster. Um, the paramedic program uh, is where you start an IV, you administer medications, you can defibrillate. Um, it, it's a, more techniques that you can do as a paramedic. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's more advanced and it's what we need to provide for our, our patients and our, our citizens. Okay. Um, as, you, as you mentioned before, right now, Acton, I think with five other towns, uh, is provided uh, uh, paramedic service through Pro EMS through uh, Emerson Hospital. Uh, I know you have uh, advocated uh, the town going to full uh, paramedic, and town meeting this past April appropriated some funds to uh, study uh, the feasibility uh, of, of of the paramedic program. So, uh, why do we need to study, uh, and 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 what, what's that all about? As managers, we want to make sure that what we do for the town is feasibly acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to start a program and have it fail because you can't fund it. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we do bill the patient's insurance companies. So that's where the funds would come to um, keep the program running. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for, is it feasible? Are we going to get money back on our investment? It, it's quite an investment. Um, 
the cardiac monitors alone are approximately $30,000 a piece. Um, you're talking three of them. Mm -hmm. So that's close to 100000 with taxes and everything. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that you're putting everything together, you have everything on the table, and it's all out in the open and everyone knows exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, and also, we'll, we'll, obviously, the study would look at, as you mentioned, the financial implications and make sure that uh, whatever fees would be associated with it could support the operation. Correct. Um, uh, so that is one of the reasons we're, we're going through this. Uh, what, if any, personnel changes have been made uh, uh, in the Acton Fire Department in, in your time here? Quite a few in, in almost 11 to 12 months. Um, I have a new deputy chief, Robert Hart. Mm -hmm. He's doing a great job. Um, when he got promoted, he created a spot that was open for the captains. And we also at that time had uh, another captain that was in an acting position. So we needed two captains. We filled those slots. That left two lieutenant slots open, and it just follows all the way down. Um, right when I got hired, we prom uh, hired three new firefighters. And through the promotion of those last two that I had talked about, we need two more additional firefighters to fill the ranks for a total of 42 total with myself and the deputy. Um, the guys are, are doing a great job of um, going through the exams. They're doing a real good job on them. So it's, it's, it's a good, good setup that we've got right now. And uh, hopefully when we finish this l next um, hiring process, we'll have some people that will be ready to go through um, some of the other training that we need to get yeah. them through. That's great. And I think it's always good that, you know, obviously promoting from within helps, uh, and I know we're going to talk about succession planning in a little while, but, you know, it, it certainly helps us, uh, you know, give people incentives to want to move on within the organization. Yes. Uh, so in, in about the year you've been here, what, what new programs have you initiated and, and, and what have you uh, kept going? We've, we've started a uh, um, training committee <coughs> that is made up of a group of um, firefighters lieutenants and captains that are willing to take their knowledge, skills, and ability and bring them to the, to the newer people. And um, we're giving them one week a month to do their training. So they come up with their outlines. They have a year's worth of um, training that they want to do. They, they scheduled which type of training they want to do per month. We also have a new EMS coordinator um, that has started his week of training per month. So the, the guys are getting more training that way. We have a clothing committee for the protective equipment for our fire gear. So they check the gear, make sure it's in good top working condition to keep everybody safe. So we've got them working. Um, we've got a couple other that uh, we're just starting. Um, Two of our firefighters are working with the COA on how we interact with the elderly. And one way that they're um, working with them is CO and smoke detectors. As, um, as firefighters, we train fourth graders. We go in all the time, do fire safety initiatives with them. We never really did too much with the elderly. So they're getting in with um, Sharon uh, from the COA, and they're doing a great job. They've got uh, smoke detectors and CO alarms ready to go. We're getting a grant that uh, hopefully that we can go ahead and get some equipment to install them for the elderly. Um, and we can go ahead and I believe the system is set up that they're going to be calling Sharon to get the mm -hmm. um, installation set up. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing we just uh, got authorization to do is CPR training for townspeople. Mm -hmm. So we've got some personnel that are instructors and they're going to be going out providing classes for CPR. Great. And when, when, when the Chief talks about Sharon, he's talking about Sharon McCurio. She's the uh, Director of the Council on Aging for the town. Uh, have you uh, 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 purchased any new equipment or, or what kind of equipment have you been, been looking at for the department? The um, Lions Club some years ago, from what I understand, bought a Zodiac boat. It's a rescue boat. And over the years it has gotten past its usefulness. Um, the boat was used right when I got here and the, the seam started to leak. So we, we're buying a new boat. Um, we did uh, federally have to narrow band our radio communication, which makes it so there's more frequencies out there for everyone is basically what it does. And through doing that, we found some information on our radios that we need to upgrade some. Uh, we have uh, walkie talkies that need to be upgraded and changed. So we're working on that. Um, so we're, we're just trying to do what we can with the money that we have and get the, the, the 
most needed items. Okay. Safety-wise, we're going with the, uh, the radios, as you know. So it's a, a plan of keeping the guys safe and uh, getting them the right, the right equipment. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the, uh, the things that the selectmen have set as a goal for myself is really to come up with a succession plan, and, and that really involves uh, uh, being able to promote within, promote people as, as, as more senior, uh, higher-ranking folks uh, retire, uh, so we have a good, steady chain of succession. And, you know, it, it is a challenge in municipal government because, you know, a lot of people uh, are probably choosing the private sector to work in. I know, you know, at least in my profession, uh, you know, not a lot of young people are going into, into city and town management. So uh, how does succession planning fit into the, into the fire department? We have a contract with uh, Local 1904, the Firefighters Union, <clears throat> which is a very good uh, contract. They have spelled out different ranks. And within that, they have requirements to get to those ranks, which is a, is a great tool for them to learn, to get education, and get their ability to go to the next step, to the next level. So once they do that, then it's, it's an easy fit. We do a test, and we move them through the ranks. Um, as far as going further with that, it kind of brings it a little bit um, to a, a, a slow when you start to say, well, who do we want to be the next deputy chief or chief? Because at that point, it's into an area where it's out of their hands. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because there's, uh, as we did a, just over a year ago, interview process with uh, many different people and uh, many different qualified people. So again, it's with the secession planning is great as long as the guys go with it. We have uh, people that are still going back to school which is uh, making themselves more promotable, and that's what we need through secession planning, and mm -hmm. it's going to work with our mm -hmm. department. And just once again, for, for the viewers, uh, in terms of, of rank within the fire department, we've got the firefighter, EMT, and I know we're now looking at, at firefighter paramedic for new hires. We have lieutenants, captains, deputy chief, and chief. We've got four lieutenants, four captains, because we have basically four, four different shifts that you, you Correct. rotate around. Correct. And, um, We've had a couple that are working up into other um, put their next rank, um, and they, they've done a great job. And uh, since the promotions, we've had uh, one person come back from an injury, so we've had to move some guys back. But they, they did a great job stepping up to uh, fill the slot, and they did the, the best they could. It was great. Mm -hmm. So obviously, when, you, when you're, you're, you're a department head, you're a chief, uh, you have to make difficult decisions. Can you give examples of what, what some of the most difficult decisions you've had to make uh, and had to deal with, and, and you know, why did you make the decisions you made? I, I think um, one that comes up, unfortunately, periodically through the, the year, um, is discipline. Mm -hmm. um, you can pre-plan buildings, structure fires, things like that, but when something pops up that's a disciplinary problem, if it comes to a chief's level, it's already been through different chains of, of command and once it gets to you it has to be dealt with and it, it takes a lot of time and effort to research it you don't want to do a knee-jerk reaction and just discipline them uh, you want to make sure one it is something that is a violation of the union contract or an SOP or a, um, a policy that's out and so you have to do some review on it once you do that you have to interview some people talk to them find out what they're positions are, why they did what they did, and then you have to take some time, um, meet with legal possibly, to make sure that it's done rightly and appropriately. You don't want to give um, somebody the more severe punishment for something that wasn't that, that bad. Right, and, and you know, and, and through union contracts, uh, uh, employees can, can grieve your decision, which means it, it comes up to my level, and I don't like them, so if you can work <laughs> them out, that's, that's all, all, all the better. Um, well, Pat, I appreciated you uh, being on the show uh, today and, uh, you know, uh, a little belatedly in introducing you to the community here on TV. But uh, uh, once again, thanks, and uh, uh, thank you to the viewers for watching, and we'll see you next time on 472 Maine.